I begin our time today with a statement that you may or may not have heard. And the statement is that the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to he who endures to the end. Again, the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to he who endures until the end. Now, question. What do you envision when you envision enduring? Do you think of somebody on a nice sunny day, 80 degrees outside, they're in the pool, they're sitting on a floaty, they got the shades on, they got the earbuds in listening to some tunes with a glass of iced tea with a nice lemon wedge on their sippy? Is that what you envision when you think of enduring? No, no, no. Me personally, because I am a northerner by birth, when I think of enduring, I think of blizzards. <laughs> Anybody ever been through a blizzard? Yeah, yeah. I think of blizzards. I remember this one particular time again, I got up and it's like six o'clock in the morning and I'm leaving the house and it's already snowing. Right. So you go out and you go about your day. I mean, it snowed all day. Getting home at six o'clock at night is still coming down. I mean, there's snow everywhere. And when you have that much snow, the streets get blocked. They get clogged. The main streets are barely passable. And the side streets, forget about it. But guess where you live at? On the side streets. So what do you do? You drive your car and you get your car as close as you possibly can to your house. And then you get out and you start walking. Now, if you ever been through a blizzard, you know, you don't just get out of the car and you just start walking. No, you have to get prepared. There's some things that you have to do. The first thing you do when you get out of the car is you button up your coat all the way to the top and you flip that collar up. You flip the collar up and then you grab it at the top. And then you put your shoulders up, you cock your head down and to the side. See, the northerners know what I'm talking about. They know that walk. You know. I came to Florida. It was a real cold day one day and I was walking like that. Guy said, hey, where are you from? Detroit. He said, Jersey in the house. See, everybody knows that. So you put your head down and you're walking. Now, as you're walking, man, you know this wind is still coming. The snow is still blowing and it's cold. And along the p- pathway, man, you get tired. You get cold. And sometimes, I mean, you're shivering. Your bones are shivering. I mean, you're just shaking. And there's a tendency to want to give up. There's a tendency to want to quit. But you don't quit. And why don't you quit? Because you envision your house right over there, a few more blocks up the street and around the corner, we're going to be at the house. And when we get to the house, man, the conditions are going to change. I'm going to get in the house. Man, the heat is on. It's going to be warm. There's food there. There's drink there. My woman is there. My kids are there. Man, the conditions have changed. And so therefore, because of that vision, you continue to persevere. You continue to go forward. Amen. And guess what? That's how it is in our Christian walk. So because sometimes in the Christian walk, man, it gets hard. It gets tough. It gets difficult. But the way to get through those difficulties is by looking ahead. By looking ahead, because you know that, man, this too will pass. One day, this is going to be over. So you continue to push forward. You continue to press forward. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about persevering during the tough times. Persevering according to the promise. And so let's go ahead and begin reading. Let's look at what the Bible says here. In the book of Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 10, starting right there in verse 36. In verse 36, it says, 
For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Let's read that again. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Stop and have your attention. Question. How many of you know that when the Lord God says that there is a need, there is a need. Have you come to that conclusion yet? When the Lord God says that there is a need, there is a need. Now, if you do not know that, if you do not understand that, if you do not embrace that, then guess what? You will not receive what it is that the Lord said you have need of. So when God says, man, there is a need, we need to take note of that. And so what the Lord is saying here, not only to the original readers, but to us here today, is that we have need of endurance. We have need of power. Why? So that we can do the will of God. Not so that we can do our own will. See, sometimes we think, man, God, I need strength. God, I need power, Lord. I want to get this done. I want to get this done. God, I want to do this. God, I want to do that. And God is into some of the things that we want to do. But the main thing that God is into is getting his will done. See, because understand something. When it comes to the will of man, it's not always right. It's not always good. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 14, in verse 12, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Now, if you're anything like me, then you have experienced that. Here you were big and bad enough and going about your business and doing whatever you want to do. And it ended in death. Sometimes it was death of a job. You're on the job. The boss, the supervisor, the manager, the CEO says, I want you to do this like this. And you're going, eh, I ain't feeling that. I'm thinking I should do this like this. And he said, yeah, I understand that. And I, I, I respect your opinion. But I want you to handle this. I want you to do this like this. But you go, no, I don't think so. Plus, Mr. Boss, plus, Mr. Supervisor, I've been thinking about this time thing. You got us coming in at 7 o'clock. I'm feeling more like maybe 9-ish. And the boss look at you and says, no, sometimes that leads to death, death of the job. You don't have a job anymore because you insisted that you were going to do things the way that you wanted to do it. Sometimes it can lead to death in a relationship. You're in this relationship and you're going to do things the way you want to do things. One of the things I always pray to the Lord is I say, Lord, help me to be the kind of husband that my wife needs. Not the kind of husband I think that I should be, but help me to be the kind of husband that she needs. So we could be in a relationship and we think that we're doing OK. We think that we're doing right or we're doing what we want to do, but it's not right. So sometimes under them circumstances, it can lead to death of a relationship. Sometimes, again, we can just, hey, well, you know, I'm doing this. And I don't care what you say. I'm going to do this and I'm going this way and, you know, whatever. And therefore, because of that attitude, because of the heart, it leads to death in a relationship. I know a cat right now who went out creeping in his relationship. And now the relationship is pretty much dead. And now they're weeping. And they're crying, man, what have I done? What have I done? I thought this was right. I thought this was okay. And man, she was looking good. And oh man, but what have I done? Sometimes again, us going our own way, us doing our own thing, we can bring death to relationship. But sometimes it can actually be physical death. Physical death. We're out there drinking and driving. 
we're out there driving and drugging. We're out there committing crimes. We're out there doing things. Sometimes we can do things that lead to physical death. And so once again, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And so what the Lord is saying to us here is that we need strength. We need his strength so that we can do his will. And here's the cool thing about it. When we say yes to that, the Lord is right there to help us. And see, I like that. I like that. Don't you like the fact that God is not like man? See, because sometimes, again, when man comes, we can look at a person, we can look at this situation, and we can say, you know what? I'm not going to help you. Many times my mom said things like this to me. I get myself in trouble and I go to mom. Mom, I, I, I need your help, mom. And she said, well, what's going on? And I would tell her the situation, and she would look at me sometimes and go, that's your bed. You made it. You got to lay in it. Other times, she would look at me and go, hmm, what? That's your little red wagon. You got to pull it. But see, God, because he is God, because he is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The moment we humble ourselves before him and say, God, I need help. He's right there to help us. Now, please understand something. That does not mean that all of the consequences of the things that we've done are going to immediately be wiped away. See, sometimes people think, you know, okay, well, I'm in trouble. Okay, God, oh, forgive me. And God says, forgive me. But that doesn't mean that the consequences of our sins are wiped away. See, understand something. God gives us the right to choose the choices that we're going to make, but he does not give us the right to choose the consequences behind the choices. Are you hearing me? God gives us the right to choose the choices that we want to make. But he does not give us the right to choose the consequences behind the choices that we make. Let's say, for example, you got a guy, right? And he's a little frisky and he's running all over town. And he's sleeping with this woman and he's sleeping with this woman and he's sleeping with this woman, you know, and then, you know, he gets AIDS and he asks God, God, please forgive me. God says, forgive him. But guess what? Still got AIDS. Right? Guy goes out, you know, I'm tired of being broke. You know, I need some money. And he goes out and start doing some things, this, that, another. He makes all kind of money. He gets caught and he go to jail. He says, God, forgive me. God says, forgiven. I'll take your sins and I'll throw them into the sea of forgiveness. But guess what? He's still in jail. And so, again, there is a way that seems right into a man, but it leads to death. But so, and so when we see our own weaknesses, when we see our own faults, when we see our own failures, we need to go to the Lord and ask the Lord to help us. And I love this. And please write this scripture down. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And second Corinthians chapter 12 and verses nine and 10, it says this, that God's strength is made perfect or is perfected in our weaknesses. God's strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. And so the moment we admit our weaknesses, God is right there to help us to make us strong. And please understand this. God wants us. God wants you. God wants me to be strong so that we can walk in the blessings that he has in store for us. Now, Again, God wants us to be strong. God wants us to walk in his blessings because God wants us to receive the fullness of his promises. Now, questions. And I always ask you guys, when you're reading the Bible, when you're listening to studies, ask questions. Ask questions because when you ask questions, then that means, again, you're thinking. And as you're thinking and you go and search for answers to those questions, then you get answers. And when you get that answer, when you get that knowledge, if you would take that knowledge and take it from your head to your heart to your feet, then you mature. 
But if you just come and you do not ask questions, if you read your Bible and do not ask questions, God, what does that mean? God, I don't understand that. God, how does that pertain to my life? Lord, you're showing me this thing that's taking place in the temple, you know, over 2,000 years ago. How does that pertain to my life? Everything in the Bible, everything in the Bible is written for our benefit. So when you ask questions, God, help me to understand that he gives wisdom. God wants us to get wisdom and especially of his promises. And so question, what are the promises of God? I don't know if you know this or not. But there's a book out there, several different ones, that says promises, the promises of God. And when you go through this book, man, you see all kind of promises that God has laid out, right? Okay, but just to give you a overall view of the promises of God, first of all, know this, and that is that all the promises of God are yes and amen, and they found in Christ Jesus. All of the promises of God are yes and amen. And they found in Christ Jesus. Now, to give you an overall view of the promises of God, turn with me, if you will, over there to Matthew chapter 19. This is some good stuff. Matthew chapter 19. Let's begin reading right there in verse 16. And it says, Behold, a man came to him, talking about Jesus, saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. And you have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, with difficulty, will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven? Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This is what I really want you to see. Verse 27. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything to follow you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, talking about the original disciples. Truly, I say to you. In the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone that includes you and I and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Stop right there if you will. Let me have your attention. First of all, know this. God would not be a debtor to any man. God would not be a debtor to any man. Look with me at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11 and verses 35 and 36, it says, who has ever given to God that God should repay him from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells again that the earth is the Lord's 
and the fullness thereof. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. And we know that because as the other scripture says, we brought nothing into this world and we're going to take nothing out. Amen. We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. Now, you can bury it with you if you want to. That is the fastest way to get dug up. You let it be known that you were buried with a whole bunch of treasures in the Middle East, over in Egypt right now. You got people going through the desert looking for stuff, looking for a pharaoh, looking for a rich person. So again, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So again, we brought nothing into this world. We're going to take nothing out. But again, God would not be a debtor to any man. Now, when you look at the, the entirety of what we just read here, what this passage of scripture is saying to us is this, that God is going to take care of us, that God is going to take care of his sons and daughters, that God is going to take care of his people from here to eternity. Are you hearing me? God is going to take care of his people. God is going to take care of his sons. God's going to take care of his people from here to eternity. And man, that's a good thing to know. Amen. Especially, especially when we're going through the trials and the tribulations of life, when we're suffering. I mean, when things are just tough. Now, I wish I really wish that I could stand up here and tell you that the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that everything is going to be sweet. That everything is going to be easy. That you always are going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I would love to be able to tell you that. But if I told you that, I would be lying to you. I would be a false prophet. Because that's not what the Bible says. In fact, Jesus says in this world, you will have tribulation. Tribulations, enduring, persevering. Is that sitting in the pool on the floaty? I don't I don't picture that. So again, Jesus said in this life, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. There is a scripture that many of you know that says this. It says, all who will live godly in Christ will suffer. How many of you have chosen that as your life verse? Anybody chose that scripture for their life verse? See, my life verse is right there on the wall. Romans 5 that God demonstrated his love toward us in this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so what that tells me is that, man, when I was as far away from God as I can be away from God, God loved me then. And if he loved me then, how much more does he love me now? See, God doesn't love me. God doesn't love us now that we're trying to walk holy and upright before the Lord. That's not when God started to love us. God loved us when we were yet dead in the trespasses of our sins. But again, I've seen a lot of people over the years claim life verses. But I've never seen anybody says, yes, all who live godly in Christ will suffer. Yes, I'm going to make that my life verse. Bring on the suffering. Yes, just, just bring it on. But it's a good thing to know, though, that in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our trouble, that God is going to be right there for us. Amen. See, because sometimes, and I don't care who you are, sometimes in the midst of your suffering, you think that you have been forgotten. You think that you have been forsaken. Can I get an amen? Again, I don't care who you are. How strong you are in the Lord. Man, when persecution comes, when trials and tribulations get real, real heavy, there comes a point in time in your life when you're just going, God, where are you? 
I know you promised me you never leave me nor forsake me, but God, where are you? Where, what's going on in my life? What's happening in my life? And the more you try to walk holy before the Lord and you get in those places and those places are the places where God grows you. Those are the places where God matures you. Do you not know? Do you not understand again when there is a drought, the roots go deep? When there is a drought, the roots go deep. As long as there's a lot of water, the roots don't go deep because they can get the water right there at the surface. But when it's dry, that's when the roots go deep. And so sometimes God allows it to get dry. Sometimes God even causes it to get dry. So again, that our roots will go deep. That's when, again, you're sitting in that place, man, and it's in that place of struggle, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you're waiting, and you begin to cry out like Job, all appointed days of my life. Shall I wait till my change comes? And when you look at the life of Job, when you look at the story of Job, Job didn't do anything wrong. You guys know the story of Job? So because sometimes we think as Christians, man, I didn't do anything to deserve this. Ever said that to the Lord? Lord, I've been a good boy. God, I've been a good girl. I know I ain't perfect, but God, I don't deserve this. When you look at Job's story, you see that Job again was a righteous man. Job actually got up and fast and prayed for his children every day. In fact, Job, Job was such a good guy that God brought Job up to Satan. Yo, Satan, look at my son Job. Look at my boy. He got it going on. No, he don't. The only reason why he serves you is because you give him everything. Let me test him. Let me take it all away. And he will curse you to your face. God says, have at it. But you can't touch your soul. See, understand, even during the trials and tribulations, there's a testing limit. God puts a limit on it, and he also has a timetable on it. He has a limit on it, and he has a timetable on it. And when he allows it, he allows it so our roots will go deep. If you know the story of Job, by the time Job went through all that he went through, and Job went through some horrific stuff, amen? Not only did he lose all of his cash, not only did he lose all of his bling bling, not did he lose all of his children, even his wife was telling him, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? So he had nothing, nothing. Everything had been stripped away from him. But through it all, again, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. And by the time the story was over, God not only had restored everything back to Job, he gave Job more than he had before. But even though Job had all of these uh, material things, the deepest part of that was this. Job said, God, I heard about you, but now I know you. I heard about you, but now I know you. See, during the midst of the trials and tribulation, that's when reality sets in. That's when it goes, the word goes from your head to your heart to your feet. See, when it's just in your head, guess what it is? It's a theory. That's all it is. I believe that God can. God said, you really believe that I can? Yes, Lord, I believe that you can. You believe that I can, uh, you know, take a few fish and multiply them? Yes, Lord. Okay, we're going to strip away that bank account then. We're going to bring you now to a few fish. No, Lord, no, 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 no. My bad, Lord, never mind, never mind, never mind. But that's where we're made at. And so what I want you to understand is when you go to that place, and you will go to that place, because that is the place where we mature at. We do not mature on the mountaintop. I know the Bible says, again, go from glory to glory to glory to glory. But guess what? If you're on the mountaintop, and that's the glory to get to the next mountain, you got to go down through the valley. Amen? Amen? And so you will get there. But it's good to know that when you get there, that you are not alone. 
You are not alone. God says again, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. Now, God said that to the children of Israel right before he was sending them into captivity. See, we claim their promise. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God knows the plans he has for me. They're good. Not to harm me, but to give me a hope and to give me a future. God said, yeah, that's the plan. I want you to know that plan. I want you to know that everything you're about to go through, that's the bottom line. Now go and start walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Know that I am with you. And so it's good, again, to know when we are in that place, that God is there. Because, again, when we're in that place, man, we all, we all begin to feel that I'm forsaken. I'm abandoned. Again, have you ever been there? I've been in places, man, I told you before, God doesn't allow me to preach things and to teach things without walking through things. And sometimes, again, people think that because you're a pastor, that it's easier for you. No, it actually gets harder. I shared with you before, and I was sharing it yesterday, how that as a pastor, some of you guys are with me and walk with me through this thing. Here we are. We're in church. Church is popping. Church is happening. Yes, Lord. We want to build. And so the Lord gives us the opportunity. We go out and we buy 12 acres of land. We bought 12 acres of land. And on this land, there's a 4,000 foot house. We fix up the house. We're making plans to build. But that was in 205. That was right when the crash came. And all of a sudden, it crashed. And man, when it crashed, within, I would say, less than a year, we bought this property. We're on the property. Now we are a million dollars upside down. We are a million dollars upside down. And because the economy is so bad, because the economy is so tough, people were moving left and right. People were leaving, going out of state, left and right. We looked up and our in, we lost 80%, 80% of our income. The more the, the property went like this, our income went like this, and I'm sitting there crying. God, God, what is this? Why is this? And in the midst of all of that, then my wife comes to me and says, oh, by the way, Big Daddy, I'm pregnant. <laughs> you have to realize our oldest child at the time was 14 years old. And so she comes and says, oh, on top of all of that, I'm pregnant. And I'm going... God, just kill me. <laughs> just take me. You don't have to kill me slowly. Just take me on out. But I'm hearing the Lord going, I would never put more on. I would never put more on you. Then you're able to bear. And I'm going, God, there's no ass on my chest. I'm not Superman. I can't take this. I can't do this. Behind our house at the time, there was a golf course that had closed down and the grass was all brown. I'm telling you, I brought that grass back to life with my tears. <laughs> Serious. I would walk out my door you know, because I'm still a man and I still got my pride. So I walk out the door and I walk way out there in that golf course there were some trees, and I just sit under the tree, and I just bawl, and I would just cry and cry and say, Dad, I don't understand. I don't understand. I asked you if this was not your will. Please don't let me go in this door. I don't understand, God, why? Why am I here? I love you. Where are you? What are we doing? 
And I cried for days and I cried for, for weeks. And I remember this one particular time I'm out there and I'm crying. And the Lord began to really just speak to my heart. And the Lord really began to minister to my heart. And the Lord says, did I not tell you that I would never leave you nor forsake you? I said, yes, Lord. He says, do you believe that? And I said, yes, Lord. But then he kind of like almost literally got in my face. He says, no, 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 no. Do you really believe that I would never leave you nor forsake you? Or is that just something you tell other people? No, Lord. I believe that. But then he still didn't stop. Do you believe, do you really believe that I work all things together for the good of those who love me, who's been called according to my purposes? Or is that just something you stand in the pulpit and tell other people? And I begin to bawl. No, Lord, I believe it. You know what he said? But what you crying for? Why are you crying? Get up. I said, Lord, well, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do, Lord? Just keep going. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, yes, Lord. Because at that point, I'm like, Peter, where else can I go? Where else can I go? So I get up and I keep walking. And the Lord again just begin to unfold things and bring revelation. And again, I want to really express that to you because again, you will find yourself in that place. Hey, I don't care how strong you might think you are. I don't care how much head knowledge and scriptural knowledge you might have. Man, when you get in that place again where the rubber meets the road and it's hard you will begin to doubt. You will begin to be shaken in your faith. But that's the place again where God makes your roots go deep. Nobody wants to be in that place because it's a hard place. It's an ugly place. And it's a place that you have to be there alone. I love my wife. I know my wife had my back in all of that. I know my children love me. I know you guys love me, but could nobody do nothing for me. What I needed, only he could do. And I had to understand that he had me there for such a time as that. And if he had me there, then yes, Lord. And again, we all get that way. We all get that way. There is a, well, let me put it this way. We all get that way, even when you go through the Bible. When you get home, I got some homework for you. Read Psalms 73. In Psalm 73, you had the psalmist who was going, my foot almost slipped. My foot almost slipped. And why did his feet almost slip? Because he's looking around and he saw the prosperity of the wicked. He's looking at them going, man, they got it going on. They live in large. They got the best houses. They got the best this. They got the finest women. They got all of this. He looked around and says, man, they're getting over. Their bodies are always strong. They're always healthy. They got plenty of wealth. They're getting over. And he says, look at my life. I'm struggling. Ever been there? Here you are. You, you walking holy the best you can before the Lord. Right. And you're suffering. You're going through. Right. You riding around your little your little car, your little hoopty or whatever. And you pull up at the traffic light and saying, please don't let this battery die. 
You're sitting there. Don't have no air conditioning. Oh, we did the light change. I need a breeze to come through here. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And then you look up and somebody pulls up next to you. Hear the music. The music is thumping and this, that, another. And you're hearing the lyrics to the song and you know they're not safe. But they ride in a Range Rover. Range Rover. And you're going, God, you said that the riches of the wicked are stored up for the righteous. Make him give me the keys. <laughs> been there? I've been there. Suffering. Suffering. And God, I'm going through and God, why? And, you know, so everybody gets there. So this is where the psalmist was. And the psalmist was in that place and just like, man. Tired. I'm tired. I'm going through. I don't understand. But then it says that the psalmist went into the sanctuary of God. In other words, he came to church. In other words, he opened up the word of God and he saw the way of the wicked. He saw that they were standing on shaky ground. He said, soon there will be no more, but the righteous, but the righteous, God guides them, God holds them. And so again, he saw what was coming. He saw what was coming. And so therefore he was able to endure what he was in. And again, I bring that to you because I know that many of you are going through things. You're suffering things. It might not be you. It might be your son. It might be your daughter. It might be your next door neighbor. It might be your friend, your grandchildren, but you're suffering because of them. God says, again, I got a plan. There's a song, and I'm going to close with this, that some of you know. This song has helped me many times over the years. In those places of suffering. The songwriter said this. I don't feel no ways tired. Because I've come too far. From where I started from. Nobody told me. That the road would be easy. But I don't believe. He brought me this far to leave me. Think about that. I don't feel no ways tired. Why? Because I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. But I don't believe He brought me this far to leave me. See, if he loved us while we were yet dead and in the trespasses of our sins, how much more does he love us now? Think about this and we're done. Again, God wants you to be strong so that you can receive the promises of God, but not only just for you, but for your sons for your daughters. Nehemiah said this, fight, fight, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your families. So again, especially us, uh, uh, as head of households, God has placed you there to fight for everybody within your household. So again, endure. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Let me give you some lessons to go home with and we're done. Lesson number one. When God shows us an area of weakness in our lives, it is so that we would lean into him so that he could supply. When God shows us an area of weakness in our lives, It is so that we will lean into him so that he could supply. From here to eternity, God promises to supply for those who are his own. From here to eternity, God promises to supply 
for those who are his own. And number three, when we walk in the promises of God, well, we walk rather in the promises of God as we stay focused on God. We walk in the promises of God as we stay focused on God. And this week's challenge is to encourage, encourage somebody to keep pressing forward. As we have been doing the last month or so, we've been ending our services in a time of prayer. We're going to continue to do that. So what I want you to pray about, especially strong today, is for those who might be here in our midst right now. And they're really, really struggling. And they're about ready to throw in the towel. They really don't know which way to go. Pray again that God will strengthen them. Pray that God will give them wisdom and knowledge. Or maybe you're sitting here and you know, again, it's a loved one. It's a family member. And they're really, really struggling. We want to pray again that God would give them the strength to to break through. We're going to stand in the gap for our family members. There's people within our community right around us. They're barely getting by. And God has called for us to make a difference for such a time as this. So, guys, if you will, go ahead and stand. And we're just going to take about five minutes or so, and we're just going to pray.